We've been studying through the Gospel of John, and today we come to a passage of Scripture right in the middle of John chapter 18, where we see the Apostle John really weave together two stories from the life of Jesus. We get one story where Jesus is on trial before Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests in Israel, and then we also get the very familiar story of Peter's denial. We have a special guest with us today that's going to give you his account of the things that took place that fateful night the things that took place both in the courtroom as well as just outside in the courtyard. You know, where I come from, if somebody says, peace be with you, usually the proper and uh, courteous response is to say it back in return. So I'll give you one more chance. Shalom. My name is Yohanan ben Zebedee, or you can just call me John. And I want to come and share a story with you. I don't know if you've ever experienced a day where you had the full range of emotions, everywhere from extreme joy to deep sorrow and even fear. And I want to share one story that contains all those elements. Really, it's not even one day. It's just part of one day. It's one evening meal. We were invited to go and share a meal with Jesus, and so we were excited about that. We went to a man's home, a young man. His name was John Mark, or you might call him Mark. His mother had prepared a meal for us upstairs, and so we went to, to share this meal not knowing it would be Jesus' last supper. As we went there, it was an exciting time where we were gathered together, the disciples, along with Jesus and some others, and then it became a bit awkward as Jesus got up from reclining at the table, and he took out the bowl and a towel, took off his outer garment, and began to wash our feet. You can imagine the awkwardness of that moment. And one by one, we kept saying, Jesus, please don't wash my feet. Till finally he came around to Peter, and Peter said what we all wanted to say, Jesus, not me, you'll never wash my feet. At which point, Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. And of course, Peter, like he normally does, made kind of a stark claim. Jesus then, wash all of me. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, just, just your, your feet will be enough. Oh, well, we had that, that meal and shared that meal. And during that meal, Jesus started talking about, about one who would betray him. One of you will betray me, he said. And we all looked around and said, who is that? Certainly not me. And again, it's Peter who spoke up in a Peter-like fashion and said, even if everyone else denies you, I never will. In fact, Jesus, I would give my very life for you. Well, during the meal, uh, for some reason, Judas got up and left. We thought maybe he was going to make some Passover arrangements or maybe to give the prescribed offering to the poor. But we had the meal, and at that meal, Jesus, well, he took some of the elements of the table, and he even said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Those words were rather lost on us then. Of course, now we understand we went out from that place, and we went down from the, the high part of the city, the new part of the city. We walked down past the, the temple mound. We went down through a valley. It's called the Kidron Valley, and went down the snake path. And, and then we climbed up on the Mount of Olives, a place that was very familiar with us because it was our custom. Jesus liked to take us there to one of his favorite spots. It was called the Garden of Gethsemane. He loved the spot, and we knew exactly why we were going there. Jesus was going there to pray, and so things took on a sense of normality. But as we were, we were there, interestingly enough, as we looked back and we, we looked at Jerusalem, we saw torches coming down the snake path, down the valley, Kidron, and then back up the Mount of Olives. And we were curious. More than that, it was a little a little terrifying to see these soldiers coming with torches. We, we didn't know why. And yet they came to the Garden of Gethsemane, and as they came to the garden, Jesus himself went out to them. And then we realized why they'd come. They'd come to arrest Jesus. We watched as they, they bound his hands behind him. But Jesus' last request, really it wasn't even a request, it was an order. He said, you came to take me, let my men go. He was looking out for his disciples. And at that point, they did let us go, and we ran. I ran, but only, only a short distance. I watched again as they continued to take Jesus away in a hurry. They led Jesus away as they bound him. They led him away, not realizing that the one who came to save all people was that day bound himself. They hurried off. 
They hurried off because they had to get things accomplished very quickly because the Sabbath was coming, and not just the Sabbath, Passover was coming. And so what they did, they did quickly. And I followed at a distance. I followed all the way back up past the temple in Jerusalem, back up to the the palace of the high priest Annas. I followed into the courtroom. High priest Annas, I probably should stop and explain something to you. As I went through not only the courtyard, but into the very courtroom, there was Annas. He was the high priest, except I've got to stop and kind of explain that. Annas was the high priest in the year of our Lord from about 6 to about 15. And at that point, we actually have a man who came and deposed Annas. His name was Gratus, and Rome had this idea that they didn't, want to, they didn't want to have power associated in just one place, and so he deposed the high priest and put another in his place, but Annas had another, uh, at least enough authority that actually was appointed one of his sons to become high priest after him, and then the next year, the same thing. In fact, four consecutive sons they deposed and put another in his place, and so the power would not reside in any one place, and then finally, the next year, we actually get his son-in-law. His son-in-law was Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas actually ruled for some time because he kind of had it in with the the Romans. They liked him because he was was really willing to compromise. In fact, he served as high priest for some time. In fact, I'm even going to find myself one day standing in front of him. But that's another story maybe I can tell later. And so, Rome actually let, let the Jews operate. And they had their own system of justice to a point. And so, we realized that while Caiaphas was the acting high priest, we knew who the real high priest was, and so that's why they took him to Annas, and it's there that that they have these proceedings. Now, now, again, the Romans allowed the Jews this sense of justice, and they could put people on trial, and they could even dole out punishments to a certain extent. Rome always had the, the opportunity to come in and supersede their rulings, but there's one area where the Romans would not allow the Jews to... uh, to control, and really it was the death sentence. You see, the Romans were afraid that uh, maybe the Jews would take those Roman sympathizers and, and execute them. And so Rome held the, Rome held the, the power of, 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 of the death sentence. And so that, for that reason, as we went before Annas, we realized there's going to be more than one trial. There's going to be a Jewish trial as well as a Roman trial. And the truth of the matter is, before it's all over, there are going to be six illegal trials. But, but it's there as we went into the courtroom of, of Annas, that Annas is going to really do this investigative uh, uh, judgment. It really, it's kind of like a preliminary hearing. He's going to gather the facts. You might even call it a grand jury, where he's going to try to say, here's the evidence against, against Jesus. And so, That's what was going to take place there in the courtroom. But as I entered the courtroom, I looked back out across the courtyard, and there was was Peter. And so I went back from the courtroom back into the courtyard. I was known to the high priest and to his servants, so I was able to enter not only into that, that courtyard, but into the, to the courtroom. But as I saw Peter there, he did not have the advantage of knowing the high priest or his servants, and so he was actually locked outside that courtyard. Now, I need to ex- stop and explain something to you. This area, the, the palace of the high priest had many areas, and not only did it have the residence of Annas, who we consider the real high priest, it also had the residence of Caiaphas, the acting high priest, also had a, a meeting area there for the Sanhedrin, and below that, there were also a dungeon and a whipping post. 
But connecting that higher level all together was this courtyard, this gated facility that, that went into each of those palaces and to the courtroom. And locked outside of that, behind a locked door or a gate, there was Peter. He had followed at a distance also, unbeknownst to me. But he couldn't get in. And so when I saw Peter, I actually went back into that courtyard. And there in the courtyard, I went over to the girl that was known to me, the doorkeeper, and I said, hey, he's with me. Can you let him in? And she went over to the gate, unlocked the gate, and let Peter in. Now, it's interesting that as, as Peter came in, she asked the natural question. She said, so are you also one of his disciples? And at that point, I couldn't believe my ears. Peter actually said, no, I'm not. It shocked me because I was the one that had gone over and asked permission for him to come in, and yet he really dished me. He didn't want to associate with me, but more than that, he actually didn't want to associate with, with Jesus himself. He said, no, I'm not one of his disciples. And what a shock. Here was Peter. Remember Peter. Peter's the bold one. If you'd asked me before that moment which of the disciples might betray Jesus, I might have named some, but it never would have been Peter. Peter was the last one any of us expected to deny Jesus. You see, Peter was always the brash one, the bold one. Peter was the one, for example, that was first out of the boat when Jesus called him. It's Peter that in that upper room said, you will never wash my feet, and then said, I will never deny you. And remember, it's also Peter at the garden that took out his sword and tried to make good on his claim that, Jesus, I would die for you. In fact, he struck the servant of the high priest Malchus and cut off his ear. Peter, and now Peter at this very moment, Peter's denying Jesus. It was hard for me to comprehend but Peter, rather than coming with me, actually went over next to the charcoal fire. Charcoal fire on that cold evening was a nice place to be and maybe a safe place. See, a charcoal fire doesn't put off much light. And so he went over and stood by that charcoal fire rather than maybe calling attention to himself by on a cold evening standing somewhere away from the fire. But he stood by the fire and warmed himself. And I actually went back in to the courtroom. There in the courtroom, the preliminary hearing took place. And it's Annas who actually comes and he starts to question Jesus. And the very first question actually made me a little uncomfortable because uh, Annas actually says, well, what about your disciples? But rather than asking that question, Jesus turned the attention back on himself. And as, as Annas questioned him about his teaching... Jesus actually stopped and said something that you need to understand. You see, actually, the Jewish system made it illegal for a trial to be held where the, 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 the one that's on trial himself is questioned. Jewish law said that a person could not incriminate himself. And so Jewish law actually said that the one on trial was not supposed to be questioned. And so he could not really give that damning evidence against himself. And so actually, this is illegal. What, what Annas is doing is he's questioning Jesus should not be happening. Uh, what should happen is Annas should be calling witnesses. And so uh, that's what Jesus actually points out. As, as Annas is asking questions, what about your disciples and what about your teaching? Jesus simply stops and says, you know, there are a lot of people who know about this. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't teach in private. I actually taught quite publicly. You can go in the area in the synagogues and find witnesses. In fact, you can go out from this very room out to the temple area, and I taught there public. There are a lot of people who can come and tell you about what I taught and, and who I am and what I said. Why don't you call witnesses? Jesus was simply trying to have things done in a proper manner and to, to really do it in the right order. But as Jesus spoke, one of the high priest's servants 
Well, rapsima. Uh, how do you say that in, in, in your language? I'm not quite sure. He took his hand, and, and with the back of his hand, he hit Jesus across the face. I've got to say, again, that act, it's highly illegal. Again, Jewish law did not allow for someone to be punished or beaten until they were convicted. And yet, with that act, it just started, well, it started all the, the beatings and the mockings and the scourgings that Jesus would go through illegally. See, this, this whole ordeal is not only done, well, late into the evening, which is illegal, and not only did it not call witnesses, which is illegal, not only was Jesus struck, which was illegal, but Annas actually quite quickly comes to the determination that Jesus was guilty. And so Jesus is going to send, uh, Annas is going to send Jesus away again for the next stage of the trial. He's going to send him off to Caiaphas, the acting high priest rejects the real high priest. He's going to send him off to Caiaphas, who before it actually testified, you know, it would be expedient for one man to die for the sins of all the people. (laughs) Some fair trial this is going to be. He'd already determined that Jesus should die, and yet he didn't realize how profound that statement actually was. It is expedient that one person die for the sins of of all the people. At that point, Anna sends Jesus off through the courtyard to the house of Caiaphas. And I myself return back to that courtyard. As I went back into the courtyard, Peter was still there standing by the fire, warming himself. And so I thought maybe I'd make myself, my, my way back over to Peter and kind of fill him in on what was happening. And as I started to go near Peter, uh, another servant went and asked Peter, you were one of his disciples, weren't you? And again, I was shocked as the one who said he would never deny Jesus, the one who said he would even die for Jesus. I, I was shocked as Peter again a second time said, no. I never knew that man. I wanted to cry out, Simon, what are you doing? But before I could speak, a servant of the high priest, a relative of Malchus. Now remember, Malchus is the servant who Peter tried to kill him by chopping off his ear. A a servant, a relative of Malchus, actually saw Peter and also recognized him and said, I know you were there. I was there with you in the garden. Weren't you there in the garden? And again, Peter denied it. And I want you to stop and think about this for a moment because there's something else that you might not be aware of. I had forgot it myself until this very moment when the relative of Malchus spoke out. Do you know what the penalty is for striking the servant of the high priest? Do you know what that is? It's actually by Jewish law, it's death. And this is a law that the Roman government will uphold. They do not want officials being attacked. And so the penalty is actually It's actually death. And so all of a sudden I pictured things differently. I realized the great, well, the great risk that Peter took as he followed Jesus to the courtyard. And there at that moment, I've got to tell you that when I realized this myself, I too was afraid, which is rather interesting. Just moments earlier, I had been in the chambers of the high priest watching Jesus with Jesus as he was on trial, but now back in the darkness of the courtyard, I experienced the fear of Peter. That put things in new perspective. Actually, I don't do what some of those other gospel writers do. They're pretty hard on Peter. They'll tell you things about what Peter did and what Peter said that as an eyewitness experience, I, I kind of put myself in his place. See, I realized at that moment maybe why Peter was afraid. When I realized that he had followed Jesus at the expense of his own life, it kind of changed things for me. 
And then now, as I was standing in the dark of the courtyard, I too was afraid. And this was really interesting because, again, I was not afraid earlier in the very courtroom, but in the courtroom I was with Jesus, and now I was outside in the courtyard without Him. And I started thinking about, well, just thinking about things in general. I remember the story of Peter that I mentioned earlier when we were in the boat and Jesus comes walking on the water. And Jesus calls out to Peter and Peter steps out of that boat and at least temporarily he walks out towards Jesus. He had, he had great courage when he was with Jesus. Or in the upper room as we were with Jesus, Peter can make this claim. Jesus, I will never forsake you. Even when everybody else abandons you, I never will. I'd even die for you, Jesus. It's easy to make that claim when you're with Jesus in the upper room. Or in the garden. As the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, it's Peter who takes out his sword. It's Peter who lashes out at the servant of the high priest. It's Peter who chops off his ear. Peter was making good in that boast. Jesus, I'll even die for you. And I've got to stop and say it's actually easy to take a stand for Jesus when you're with Jesus. And as I thought about my own life, it's easy to stand in the courtroom with Jesus. It's much harder to stand in the dark, in the shadows, in the courtyard without him. And that put things in a new perspective. You know, as Peter denies Jesus not once, not twice, but three times, the rooster crows. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus that said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Jesus, uh, uh, Peter went out from that spot and wept bitterly. I've got to tell you the rest of the story. You know, Jesus, that was the last time that we saw Jesus before he was hanging on the cross. Jesus willingly goes to the cross and he dies for us. We watched as Jesus died, he was buried. And yet, you know the story that later Jesus Christ rose again. And when Jesus comes back and meets with the disciples, he actually seeks out Peter. And he goes back and restores Peter. I want you to understand the depth of these words where Jesus himself goes and restores Peter and says, Peter, won't you, won't you follow me? Won't you feed my sheep? You need to recognize the depth of compassion that Jesus has even for a betrayer like Peter. Jesus loved him. Jesus loved me. And you need to understand that no matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus loves you. Jesus restored Peter. But there's more to the story that I want to tell you. Not only the fact that, that, that Jesus wants to restore you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, even if you've forsaken him, even if you've denied him, Jesus loves you and wants to reconcile you to himself, but also understand this, that Jesus willingly took your punishment. And I've got to tell you part of the story. You know, it's interesting that in the upper room, Jesus really was looking out for us. Uh, Jesus was telling us exactly what was going to happen and how things would unfold. We didn't understand it completely, but Jesus even left us reminders of who he was and what he did for us because he was concerned about us. And as Jesus went to the garden, as the soldiers came and approached, as they arrested Jesus, remember it's Jesus who says, you came to seek me, you let these people go. Jesus was looking out for us as disciples, saying, arrest me, you leave the disciples alone. And even as Jesus goes into the very presence of the courtroom, as Anna starts questioning about the disciples, Jesus changes the subject. And Jesus says, if you want to know about me, there are plenty of witnesses. See, it's interesting that even in those final hours, Jesus had determined that he would give his life as a ransom for many, that Jesus would take upon himself our sins, that Jesus was willing to give himself for us. Unlike Peter, in the courtyard, who was looking out for himself. See, that's who Jesus is. Jesus not only loves you, but he willingly gave his life for you, that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you can be reconciled to him. But I just want to leave you this closing thought. As I, I witnessed Peter, and in my own life, I want to tell you, it's much easier to stand with Jesus even in the courtroom 
than it is to stand in the shadows without Jesus. The problem with Peter, Peter followed at a distance. Peter didn't follow close enough. And I'm just wondering for you, are you following Jesus at a distance or are you really following Jesus? Because it is much easier to stand with Jesus in the courtroom than it is to stand in the courtyard without him. I'm simply challenging you to come out of the shadows and follow Jesus completely. Shalom. Shalom.